Hello, and welcome to Goose Drunks. Today we're going to be reading a real classic, The Road by Cormac Mc... Monster Blood. And today what we're going to be drinking is a lovely white wine. The rules are very simple. Drink if it's spooky, drink if it's silly. Yum. So this book starts like pretty much any other Goosebumps book where a child is yelling about how he doesn't want to be somewhere. Evan Ross is our main character, our 12 year old. Okay, Evan's screaming that he hates when his mother touches his hair and he hates her and he's being just kind of a little dick. So parent, Mrs. Ross exposits angrily that Evan is going to be staying with Catherine, his great aunt, but Evan's like, she's a total stranger. Apparently his mom and dad are going out of town for a quote unquote family emergency. I want to believe that it's like not an emergency at all. They're just like, we need a break. This kid sucks. Sometimes you need a day off, you know, you need to decompress. And Evan has done my least favorite thing and brought his old ass dog with him to his great aunt's house. The dog is named Trigger. He is a Cocker Spaniel. And if it were any other children's book series with a couple notable exceptions, I would assume that they were not going to kill the dog. But this is Goosebumps and we're batting a thousand on dog kills. And then his mom is knocking and Evan's like, Mom, why are you knocking? You said Aunt Catherine was totally deaf. Um, I am wary that RL is not going to be spectacularly sensitive in his treatment of this woman. The 90s were fun. So his mom's like really embarrassed. I'm thinking of the time that Ryan Seacrest tried to high five a blind dude on um, American Idol. As you should be. Well, I'm giving you a high five. Congratulations. There it is. Where it's just that kind of level of like, you know, they're probably not offended, but you're still so embarrassed you want to die. As you should be. So here's what we know about Catherine, Evan's great aunt, who he's staying with, the perfect stranger. She's very stubborn. She's an old, old lady. She has been deaf for 20 years. So they are being, they're like legit, no, she's not hard of hearing, she is deaf. She refuses to learn sign language or to even learn how to lip read. There's no one else that they can leave him with because apparently everyone else is away on vacation. Okay. Mr. Ross is like, all right, it's gonna be fine. Catherine's a bit weird, but she's perfectly harmless. Okay, Catherine opens the door. She is a large woman with startling black hair. Uh, and she like fills the doorway and she's holding a knife and the blade of the knife was dripping in blood. Dun, dun, da, end of chapter one. Only took like 15 minutes. So she's not like anything Evan had pictured, obviously. He's like, oh, I thought she was gonna be a small, frail old lady, but no, she's like a large woman, very robust, broad-shouldered and tall. She's wearing a peach-colored house dress, has straight black hair pulled back and tied behind her head in a long ponytail that flowed down the back of the dress. She wore no makeup and her pale face seemed to disappear under the striking black hair, except for her eyes, which were large and round and steely blue. Yeah, she's just me in the future, pretty much. So in a surprisingly deep voice, she says, I was slicing beef. And then she stares at Evan. You like beef? He's like, yep. RL clarifies that her voice was deep, as deep as a man's, and she spoke clearly without the indistinct pronunciation that some deaf people have. Jesus, RL. So the dog's like barking and barking and barking. Mom's like, can't you get that dog quiet? And everyone's like, well, she can't hear it. So yeah, this is very good. I'm so excited this is happening. Catherine like grabs him under the chin and she's like, good looking boy. 
he likes the girls. I feel like I'm just gonna give her like a bad like Boris and Natasha accent. Like that feels right to me. So you've got the girlfriend. Yeah, that works. Evan's like, no, not really. And Catherine's like, I knew it. Yes, yes, you do. And Mrs. Ross is like, what do we do with the suitcase? And Catherine's like, he likes girls. Catherine's like, I'm gonna bake you a pie. You should roll out the dough. Did your father tell you I was a scary old witch? Cause I am. Trigger's just barking and barking and barking because obviously Catherine's evil. Evan's like, I don't want a pie. I don't like it here. Blah, blah, blah. She hurt me. She squeezed my shoulder really, really hard. His mom gives him a $10 bill, <laughs> which in the 90s, I know that was like $3,000, but still, what's he going to do with that? And then mom's like, I'll call you from Atlanta. Bye. So Catherine's house seems really boring. He's wandering around exploring. He doesn't find a TV, but he does find a bookshelf. And the bookshelf is full of all these science books. He's like, oh, maybe Catherine's husband had been some sort of like scientist way back in the day because of all these science-y books. And it's like, why couldn't Catherine have been a scientist, huh? Who's to say? Who's to say? It's pretty sexist. It's the 90s, man. And he's like, nothing for me to read. Did you not bring any of your own books? Or like a Game Boy? And then he opens the closet door, something leaps out at him, and he's like, help, I can't see. End of chapter. Dun, dun, dun. dun, 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 dun. Chapter three. Okay, it's a cat. The cat's name is Sarah Beth, which is really funny. I went to a high school with a girl named Sarah Beth, and now she's a cat. And Catherine's like, sorry, my cat's evil. <laughs> which is fair. That is, I feel like R.L. Stein might own cats. I have a cat. He's good. He's sitting right off camera. He's just staring at me this whole time. I feel like I'm letting my son down. I'm just making eye contact with him and drinking a big bucket of wine. And then Trigger, the very old dog, leaps up and snaps at the cat. The cat like hisses and like climbs up in Catherine's arms. And then Catherine's like, bring the dog. We can't have animals fighting in this house. And then Catherine's like, Sarah Beth is a bad one. We can't get her riled, can we? My Russian accent is bad, you guys. It's like really not good. And she's like, I have to take care of dog. Like, oh my God, I cannot. I'm really excited for the Goosebumps chapter where she graphically kills a dog. Anyway, Evan's pretty much got the same thought because he's like, what's she going to do with Trigger? Dun, dun, dun. End of the chapter. I'm drinking for poor, poor Trigger. Oh, but then it's like really nice. She she like takes them out back with the dog and there's like a, in the yard, there's like a long fenced in her area and she's like, it's special place for a dog. She knew he was bringing a dog and she knew she had a cat. So she set up an outdoor area for the dog in case the dog and the cat didn't get along. Like it's very thoughtful. And Evan's like, I don't want to leave my dog out here in this prison. Like, isn't that better than terrorizing the dog with a mean cat or like, her killing it, which was what you initially thought she was going to do. Like, let's weigh our options here, my friend. And then he's like, I'm gonna take my dog for a walk. And Catherine's like, I'm deaf sometimes in this book. And Evan's like, walk. And she's like, oh yeah, okay. So he goes to get Tigger and he puts him on a leash, takes him for a walk, and he's startled by a hand grabbing his shoulder. And someone's like, who are you? Dun, 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 end of chapter. It's probably like a neighborhood kid because he doesn't have a companion yet other than an old dog and that's no fun for goosebumps yep there's a girl standing behind him staring at him with dark brown eyes and he's like why did you grab my shoulder like that and she's like to scare you and he immediately has a crush on her because as Catherine established he likes girls so she's pretty she has short wavy brown hair that's almost black and flashing brown eyes and a teasing smile oh my god <laughs> She was wearing an oversized yellow t-shirt over black spandex leggings and bright yellow Nikes. Rad. She's got a cool BMX bike and she's got a sense of humor. So obviously she's perfect. She's like, I like your dog. He looks really stupid. I like stupid dogs. I'm a big fan of her already. I hope she turns out to be like an evil monster. That would make her perfect. <laughs> she's like, what's his name? Does he have a stupid name? And Evan's like, his name's Trigger. And she's like, yeah, that's pretty stupid. And Evan's like, thanks. This is the most relatable relationship I've seen between two characters. Like they're both people. It's really neat. What a fun concept. My girl's like, it's okay. I have a stupid name too. It's Andrea. Full offense to all the Andreas out there. She's like, oh, it sounds very stuck up. So I just make people call me Andy. And Evan's like, well, my name is, and she interrupts him. She's like, don't tell me. 
And she's like, hmm, let me guess. Is it also a stupid name? He's like, yep, it's Evan Stupid. And she laughs, and he's like, oh, I made her laugh. Young romance. can't believe there's a romance plotline in this Goosebumps book. Very mature, R.L. This book is rated T for teen. She's like, what are you doing? He's like, I am walking my dog, exploring the neighborhood. And she's like, well, it is boring. Let's go into town. It's only a few blocks away. And he's like, what the heck? What could possibly happen? That is not a dun dun dun, even though it's the end of the chapter, so I can't drink. So Andy says that she has to go to a toy store and look for a present for her cousin. So they're already in this cute, like, playful teasing each other relationship. They're obviously perfect for each other, which means she is obvi there's obviously something wrong with her. Like, she's definitely a monster or a ghost or whatever. They go into town. There's a small brick post office, a barber shop with an old-fashioned barber pole out front, a grocery, a drive through bank, and a hardware store with a large sign in the window proclaiming a sale on birdseed. Yippee. The toy store is the next block. Actually, there are two toy stores, an old one and a new one. This town doesn't even have a Starbucks and it's got two toy stores. That is quaint. She's like, I am not sure he will let you bring your dog in. <laughs> and Evan's like, we'll see. But everything's fine. They're wandering around this old dusty ass store. Evan's like, why do you like this place? And Andy's like, I just think it's neat. I just think they're neat. You can find some real treasures here. It's not like other toy stores. It kind of sounds like it's a thrift store or a Goodwill and the other one is a toy store. Evan picks up this lunchbox that has a cowboy dressed in black on the side and it says Hopalong Cassidy. And he's like, who's Hopalong Cassidy? It is my stripper name. Andy's like, oh, maybe I'll give it to my cousin. He likes stupid names like Hopalong Cassidy. Ouch. They're just about to leave. He's j And then he goes to his small back room and then he's like, He's looking around, he sees worn looking stuffed animals tossed into cartons, games in faded yellow boxes, baseball gloves with the leather worn thin and cracked. Uh, he's about to leave when something catches his eye. It's a blue can about the size of a can of soup. Bringing it close to his face to examine it in the dim light, he read the faded label, Monster Blood. You have to drink if they say the title. These are the rules, I don't make them. I mean, yes I do, and that's why I say it's the rule now. It says in smaller type, surprising miracle substance and he's like oh yeah i have ten dollars in my pocket from my mom which is actually the first time i can remember rl setting something up and having there be payoff for it so i'm actually very impressed by the writing so far anyway he turns around he sees the store owner standing in the doorway his dark eyes wide with anger and he yells what are you doing back here dun 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 evan's like how much for this monster blood Owner says it is not for sale. It is too old and probably no good anymore. Evan's like, can I have it for less since it's so old? I like the way he haggles. That's very impressive. And he's like, I want one. And Evan's like, there's only one. The owner's like, it is no good. You can't buy this. Why do you want this? I just think they're neat. And then Andy and Evan are argue arguing over who's going to buy it. The owner's just like, both of you share it. I don't care. Get out of my fucking store. He actually says fucking. That's the thing. If your book is rated G for children, you can say one fuck bomb. These are the rules. The man sells it to them for $2. So if you th thought he was trying to like protect them, he legitimately was like, I don't want to get sued because it's old. But $2, that's like $1,000 in 1992. And so they leave the store. Andy is like pissed off. She wants to buy the monster blood from him for like, five dollars i'm immediately suspicious of andy that's ridiculous there's no way this thing is worth five dollars so they go back to Catherine's house and Catherine's like what do you got there she like holds out her hand to see the monster blood and evan hands it to her she studies it for a long time and then finally hands it back to evan he and Catherine start heading up to where his room is and then he hears Catherine say something to him in a low whisper he couldn't quite hear what she had said but it sounded like be careful pretty spooky i'm gonna drink they go up to his room andy goes over to his bookshelf and is immediately like you've got like old books about magic and stuff what the heck i wonder why your aunt has all of these see her assumption is not that they belonged to Catherine's former husband weird she's like i thought you said there wasn't anything here all these books are so cool and he's an idiot so he's like oh i don't want to read i like reading me 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 and then she's like, open up the can. It's probably really gross and rotten because it's super old. And they're like, ooh, maybe, which is super my react, like what I would do. So I identify with him again, even if he's an idiot. She seems cool, even if she's probably a monster. So he's having a hard time 
opening the thing and then he just like slams it down on the desk and then the lid pops off and then she and then they both peered inside the can end of chapter drink for end of chapter okay the substance inside the can is bright green it shimmered like jello in the light from the ceiling fixture hmm evocative and he's like touch it i love her I would say that too, Andy. And Evan's just like, all right, but before he has a chance, she reaches out a finger and she pokes it. And then she's like, it's cold, touch it, it's really cold. I'm so on Andy's side right now. Evan pokes it with his finger and uh, apparently the monster blood feels cold, thicker than jello, heavier. When he pulls his finger out, it makes a loud sucking noise, gross. And Andy's like, gross. <laughs> I'm gonna drink for every time I'm delighted by Andy now. That's the rule special to this book that I just made up. And he's like, I'm going to turn the lights off. I bet it glows in the dark. And they take it into the closet and they close the door and it glows in the dark. She was super right. Evan's just like disappointed by it because he sucks. He's like, I've had other stuff that did this, like alien stuff or yucky glop or whatever the heck. And Andy's like, if you do not want it, I will take it. I'm very suspicious of her, but I think she's rad, so I don't care. And so Andy takes a handful out. And she's like, oh, it's even colder outside the can. And when you squeeze it flat, it pops right back. So Andy bounces it on the floor and it bounces back and then she threw it against the wall and it bounced against the other wall and went flying out the bedroom door and then they go outside to get it and it's left a stain on the floor because children are idiots and never let them into your home or they'll destroy everything. So they decide to take it outside and toss it around so, t so Trigger won't be lonely. Really excited for Trigger to inevitably eat this stuff and uh, die or whatever. It's going to be really great and really going to love it when they have to smite the dog. They're playing catch and then the gunk sails over Andy's outstretched hands. Evan's like, oh, sorry. And it lands right in front of Trigger and then Trigger eats the ball of monster blood because that's what I said would happen. It's very stupid. I'm going to drink. It's like the first really stupid thing they've done so far in the book though and it's chapter eight so pretty respectable for a Goosebumps book is what I'm saying. Evan has the right thought. He's like well what if it's poison and my dog gets sick? So dun dun dun. What if the dog gets sick from this? That's that's actually the plot of this story is a dog eats some mysterious gunk from a can and gets really sick and they have to pay eight thousand dollars at the vet to fix it. So the next chapter opens up three days later. I guess the dog's fine. Evan's pissed because Catherine only has shredded wheat and he hates it apparently. Catherine's like, oh, it looks like it might rain. And Evan looks and it's like bright sunlight outside. And she's like, okay, crazy. And then he sees she's wearing this necklace. Um, it's got a pendant that's cream colored and sort of bone shaped. And then Evan's like, no, I think it is a bone. So that's weird, kind of spooky and drink. Ooh, I just almost spilled that on myself. And then Evan's like, I thought of a call that I had the night before with my mom. Like, okay, you're telling me that you flashed us forward three days just so he could immediately flash us back to the night before? Just start on the night before. Why did we have to do this? Stupid RL, very bad writing, very sloppy. Anyway, he tells us about how he gets a call from his mom. He's like, how's it going in Atlanta? She's like, um, it's going a little longer to find a house than we thought. And then Evan's like, when are you going to pick me up? And mom's like, that is the problem. It, we may need a few more days down here than we thought. It's kind of rude to Catherine, but whatever. I mean, Evan's clearly a massive inconvenience for her. She's not prepared to take care of a child. So Evan goes to walk to Andy's house. He doesn't bring Trigger because Trigger's sleeping. Um, but still alive. He's halfway down the next block. Thinking about his parents is very sweet. Uh, when, a bo when a boy's voice called, hey, you, and two boys stepped onto the sidewalk in front of him, blocking his way. And Evan turns and looks. They are identical twins that are big, beefy guys with short, white blonde hair, round, red faces. Two little Dudley Dursleys, Dudley 1 and Dudley 2. I do not care what their names actually are. These are their names. They're both wearing dark t-shirts with the names of heavy metal bands on the front. I want you to know that heavy metal is hyphenated. They're like, who are you? And Evan's like, I'm staying with my aunt over there. And they're like, mm, only residents can walk on this block. Sorry, they're British because they're Dudleys. Sorry, only residents can walk. And the other one's like, yeah, you're not a resident. Evan's like, whoa, that's a big word. Which is not even clever enough to be worth getting his ass beat over. And they're like, we're gonna kill you. And so they start to move in on him. Dun, dun, dun. Very stupid, very end of chapter chapter 10 where do you think you're going 
One of the twins asked, you guys like that accent? Isn't it authentic sounding? Pay a toll, maybe. And Dudley 2 is like, yeah, you could pay the non-resident toll, you know, to get temporary permission for walking on this block. And he's like, I don't have any money. But he had $8 in his pocket. Just give it to them. It's not worth your life, you idiot. He backed away with his legs feeling heavy from fear. And then he hears Andy's voice be like, hey, what's going on? She should have a different voice. She can be Southern. Hey, what's going on? And she's like speeding toward them on her bike. And she calls them Rick and Tony, but their names are ob ob obviously Dudley 1 and Dudley 2. Although Rick and Tony are two hilarious names for 12-year-old boys. We were welcoming him to the neighborhood. Dudley 2 started to add something, but Andy interrupted him. Well, leave him alone. We'll just borrow your bike and leave him alone. And Andy's like, no way. But then Dudley 1 grabs the handlebars. It's very hard to maintain, but I'm doing it for you guys. She loses her balance. The bike topples over on top of her. And then Dudley 2 reaches down and grabs the bike away. So Andy did not beat them up like I thought she was going to. But they steal her bike and pedal away very, very fast. But hey, at least Evan still got his $8. She's like, I hate those creeps. Evan's like, who are they? They're the Bamer twins. Ah, uh, real heavy duty dudes, she says. <laughs> duty dudes. <laughs> so Andy exposits that these two jackasses just run wild. They don't have anyone at home to check up on them. They live with their grandmother, but she's never around. She's a very busy lady, okay? Women can have hobbies. Evan's like, I was afraid I was going to have to pound them, like, all jokingly. And it's like, dude, she just got her bike stolen. And she's, like, kind of having the same um, attitude where she's like, my, I just got my bike stolen. So Andy goes back to her house and Evan goes back to Catherine's um, daydreaming about fighting those dumb, dumb twins. Uh, he went upstairs and then the blue container of monster blood caught his eye. He walked over to the bookshelf and picked up the can from the middle shelf and pulled off the lid. The can was nearly full. I guess Trigger didn't eat that much, he thought, feeling a little relieved. But then he's like, oh, I forgot all about Trigger. Poor Trigger must be so, so hungry. He puts on the monster blood, bombed down the stairs. Don't know what that means, so I'm going to drink for it. And then runs full speed out the door to where the dog is. But halfway across the backyard, Evan could see that something was wrong. Trigger's eyes were bulging. His mouth was wide open, his tongue flailing rapidly from side to side white spittle running down the chin hair onto the ground the dog was gasping hoarsely each breath a desperate difficult struggle and as evan reached the dog run trigger's eyes rolled back and the dog's legs collabed under him his stomach still heaving the air filled with his loud hideous gasps okay i'm gonna take a minute i'm gonna drink for trigger one of two things is going to happen now. One, I'm going to look back at that book and Trigger is going to be fine. And then Evan's going to eat the monster blood one way or another. Two, I'm going to look back at that book and Trigger is going to have died. And then RL is going to have to justify Evan eating the monster blood. So let's see which one it is because I am not ending on that note. So Evan's like, hold on, big fella, just hold on. And Evan struggles to pull his collar off because that seems to be the thing. Like, it's becoming way too tight on him. And once he takes the collar off, the dog jumps immediately to his feet and licks Evan's face appreciatively, covering Evan's cheek with his thick saliva, whimpering as if he understood that Evan had just saved his life. It's very fortunate timing. If Evan had... Think about this. If Evan had gone to Andy's house, then he wouldn't have been there for Trigger having his, like, choking on his collar attack, and Trigger would have died. So really, when you think about it, the Dudley Dursley twins saved Trigger's life. I guess I have to love them now? And Evan's like, why did this collar shrink like that, boy? Like, Trigger had something to do with it. <laughs> he kind of did. Obviously, we know why it did it, but Evan's an idiot, so it's going to take him a minute to figure it out. And then he looks at Trigger, and he's like, Trigger has uh, grown in size. Evan's like, this must be a trick of the light, or my eyes are deceiving me or something. There is no way Trigger at the tender age of 12 years old, which is 84 dog years old, there's no way he had a second growth spurt. What could he have eaten that would have caused this? So the next morning, it's all overcast. There's an autumn chill in the air. Evan goes to Andy's house. Uh, he finds her huddled under a big maple tree in the neighbor's front yard. Then he saw that she was leaning over something, her hands working quickly. 
Come help me, she cried, not looking up. Evan gets over there. He sees that Andy is trying to free a calico cat that had been tied to the tree trunk. And Andy's like, the Bamer twins did this. I know it. That's horrible. Leave cats alone. Cats are great. The cat's so scared. It's been tied to the tree all night. This book is very heavy on the animal abuse. I'm not into it. The cat's like screaming. It's cat sounds. And Evan's like, can you stand still? And that's not helpful. It's a cat. And they release the cat. The cat gives one last cry of protest and then sprints away at full speed without even looking back. Evan's like, oh, he didn't even say thank you, which, okay, that's fair. That's also very unlike a cat. Like, cats get it when you save their lives. They do understand. Evan suggests calling the police or the ASPCA, which is valid. He notices Andy's outfit, which is different than the outfit she was wearing before, which is delightful because very rarely do characters get costume changes in Goosebumps books. She is today wearing faded denim jeans and a pale green oversized t-shirt that came down nearly to her knees. Baller. So they're trying to figure out how to teach the Bamer twins a lesson. They go back to Evan's house. Catherine is concentrating on a jigsaw puzzle in the dining room table. On the dining room table. In the dining room table. Good lord. And he's like, why does she wear a bone around her neck? And Evan's like, probably thinks it's cool. It is cool, Evan. And Evan's like, oh, you're a crazy old coot to Catherine. And she looks up from her puzzle pieces and stares at him coldly. And Andy's like, she definitely heard you. And he's like, ah, don't be dumb. You don't be dumb, Evan. And they get back and Andy's like, where's the monster blood? I really would like to eat some seriously. It's not suspicious at all. She held up the can. The green gunk had pushed up the lid and was flowing up out of the can. What? Da, 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 da. Chapter 12, uh, it is not cold anymore. It's our observation. Evan doesn't seem to care about why it's maybe overflowing out of the can. When before it was as it was thick enough to mold into a rubber ball and stay that way. It is also getting sticky, according to Andy. And she's like, it wasn't sticky before. And he's like, I don't know, it's the same stuff. I don't know what to tell you, girl. They tried to bounce it on the floor. It doesn't bounce, it just sticks to the floor. So they're playing with it. And then a soft mewing sound made them both turn toward the door. Evan was surprised to see Sarah Beth standing there, her head cocked, her yellow eyes staring at him. Or was she staring at the glob of monster blood in his hand? And he's like, that cat looks very intelligent. Evan's like, it is as stupid as every other cat. No, she just wants to play ball with the monster blood. And Andy's like, Andy's like sorry cat, it don't bounce. And Sarah Beth's like, oh, grumble, grumble, and turns and pads out of the room. Evan's like, how do I keep this stuff? It's too big for its can. Get rid of it, you lunatic. Oh my god. If it's growing, there is no possible reason for that to be happening. That is bad. Get rid of it. And Andy double dares Evan to taste it. And then Evan triple dog dares Andy to taste it. And Andy's like, that's cheap as hell. You taste it. And Evan's like, okay, whatever. And he grabs a big hunk of it and heaves it at Andy. And she laughs. And she picks it up off the carpet. And she tosses it at his face. And then it sticks to the wall. And they have a big, hilarious monster blood battle. Woohoo! And then as they tried to clean up, they both heard Trigger through the open window. He's barking loudly out in his pen. And they look out there and Andy's like, hey, what's with Trigger? Is your dog still growing? He looks so big. And then he, Evan's mouth drops open when he realizes that Andy was right. Trigger had nearly doubled in size. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 13 starts with uh, Evan racing after Trigger, who has apparently escaped his pen, even though Arl did not feel it necessary for us to know that. He just says it. The dog's sprinting down the street. Evan's calling Trigger's name. He was already the size of a pony and getting larger by the minute. That's very bad. And then Dudley 1 and Dudley 2 show up to just make everything even worse. And Evan realizes that Trigger was chasing them. Oh, good boy, Trigger. Oh, shoot. Okay. Suddenly, as Evan watched in horror, the dog raised up on his hind legs. He tilted his head to the sky and let out an ear-piercing howl. Not the howl of a dog. A creature howl. Then, Trigger's features began to transform. His forehead burst forward and enlarged. His eyes grew wide and round before sinking under the protruding forehead. Fangs slid from his gaping mouth, and he uttered another howl to the sky, louder and more chilling than the first. He's a monster, Evan cried, scary. And then he woke up, stupid. I should have known better than to expect RL to go, to go full werewolf halfway through the book. Pfft, come on. I'll be amazed if they don't wind up going to alien camp at the end of this. 
And then he realized he was in bed in the study upstairs in Catherine's house. It had all been a dream. A frightening, wild chase of a dream. A harmless dream. Except something still wasn't right. The bed felt so uncomfortable and cramped. And Evan sat up, alert, wide awake now, and stared at his giant feet, his giant hands, and realized how tiny the bed seemed beneath him. That's how I wake up every morning, Evan. You get used to it. He was a giant now. He had grown so huge, so monstrously huge. And when he saw how big he had become, he opened his mouth wide and began to scream. Dun, dun, dun. It's pretty intense. So that's about halfway through the book. A little more than halfway, in fact. In the interest of ending on a decent cliffhanger, I'm going to stop there because that's pretty good. Uh, I will be back. Part two will be coming next week. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, slash don't mind that I'm doing it in two parts. If you prefer it, the longer videos, um, let me know in the comments. Pretty good so far. This is actually, I think, the first Goosebumps book where I'm like, I were the, uh, the, this is the first Goosebumps book I remember reading in a while where, like, the friend character or the sibling character or whoever their, like, sidekick is, um, wasn't unbelievably annoying and had, like, their own personality. And I really like Andy and I can't wait for her to reveal herself to be a monster. But, uh, yeah, so I will see you guys in the next one in part two. Hope you enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe, all that standard YouTuber shit. I'm going to chug this wine now. Jesus Christ. Oh, that is not good. That is not chugging wine.